brought to you by Head Start Basketball. Hey, hoop heads, wanted to take a minute to shout out our partners and friends at Dr. Dish Basketball. We've had their partnership manager and training specialist Jefferson Mason and marketing manager Nick Bartlett on the show in the past, and we couldn't be more excited about what they're doing for the game of basketball. Their Dr. Dish shooting machines are undoubtedly the most advanced and user-friendly machines on the market and truly accelerate skill development faster than ever. Beyond efficient reps, Dr. Dish provides training expertise and versatility designed to develop complete players. The new Dr. Dish CT machine has further revolutionized basketball training with over 150 plus on-demand individual and team workouts from some of the best coaches and trainers in the game. These workouts include video instruction and combine game-like shooting drills with ball handling, conditioning, and agility drills. Along with workouts, the Dr. Dish Training Management System also provides stat tracking and analytics to track progress and ensure accountability. These are just a few reasons why top programs like Duke, North Carolina, Louisville, Florida, Baylor, and countless others are upgrading to Dr. Dish. Learn more at drdishbasketball.com Follow their incredible content at Dr. Dish B-Ball on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. And make sure you mention the Hoop Heads podcast to get $300 off your next Dr. Dish purchase. That's a great deal, Hoop Heads. Get out and get your Dr. Dish shooting machine today. It's all about the players. It's not about the coach. Uh, being able to avoid controversy and talking down to players, having too many rules. Uh, you know, you got the job. They know who the boss is. You know, you don't have to prove it to them. It's about them. It's not about the coach. Dave Severns is currently a pro personnel scout for the Los Angeles Clippers. Prior to holding this position, he was the director of player development for the Clippers from 2010 to 2016 under head coach Doc Rivers. Before joining the Clippers in 2010, Severns held the same role with the Chicago Bulls, where he worked under then Bulls head coach Vinny Del Negro. Dave also has six years of college coaching experience, including three seasons as an assistant coach at Fresno State for Jerry Tarkanian. At the start of his career, he spent many years as a high school teacher and coach in the state of California. Throughout his time coaching, Dave has directed and worked at camps throughout the world in China, Norway, as well as here in the United States. Dave has been a staple at Snow Valley Basketball Camp for over 30 years. Severance has worked directly with and helped develop NBA stars like Blake Griffin, Derek Rose, Chris Paul, and Joakim Noah in his roles with both the Clippers and the Bulls. Hoopheads Nation, if you love what you're hearing, please leave us a five-star rating and review wherever you listen to the show. Believe it or not, those ratings help others in the basketball community find the Hoopheads pod. We would also appreciate you sharing the show with one friend or coaching colleague that you know would enjoy listening to the Hoopheads podcast. And if you're not subscribed yet, just hit the subscribe button in your favorite podcast app so you never miss an episode. You can find the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Google Play, and YouTube. Take some notes as you listen to Dave Severns from the Los Angeles Clippers as he talks about his career journey and shares 10 mistakes that he sees high school coaches making that can hold them back from the success they're striving for with their career and their teams. Hello and welcome to the Hoop Heads Podcast. It's Mike Cleansing here with my co-host Jason Sunkel. And tonight we are very pleased to welcome to the podcast, special guest Dave Severance from the Los Angeles Clippers, pro personnel scout. Dave, welcome to the show. Thank you, guys. We are super excited to have you on, get a chance to talk some Clippers basketball, learn a little bit more about your basketball journey. We're coming off a big win last night for the Los Angeles Clippers in the opening night of NBA, the NBA season, knocking off your cross-town rival, the Lakers. So that had to feel good for the organization. Well, it was good because, our, you know, our guys played well. We, we really didn't have a very good preseason. You know, we we played three NBA teams and lost all three of them. The only teams we beat were Melbourne and uh, and Shanghai. So, you know, it, it was good to play, play uh, you know, better than we had in the preseason. That, so that was the most exciting thing was to see our guys finally – kind of play well be, to be honest be honest with me did you, were you guys a little scared at the beginning of the game when the lakers started off so strong or was that just uh you no. know part of the nba no no okay no we, we were fine because we still had lou williams and montrez to come into the game <laughs> yeah well, start running some pick and roll you'd be fine right <laughs> that's the way it works that's the way it works all right so dave i want to go back in time to when you were a kid and talk a little bit about what got you into the game of basketball 
when you were younger? What made you fall in love with the game of basketball? Well, I, I grew up in a small, small farming community and, you know, we played all three sports, you know, football, basketball, baseball, uh, from a young age. Um, and so re really I didn't have a favorite until probably my junior, senior year in high school when I, when I grew a little bit and, and I really got into basketball as my favorite. And, um, uh, so that that's kind of how it developed. But we, we grew up playing everything, uh, me and all, all my buddies. But really found kind of a niche in basketball uh, in high school, and you know was able to play a little bit in college, and then uh, you know took off from there. So that's that's kind of how it started. So as you were growing up in the game, and you started, you know, continued on and decided that you were going to focus on basketball. You got an opportunity to play a little bit in college. What was the point where you started to think that maybe coaching might be in your future. Was there was there a like a light bulb moment, or was it just something that slowly developed over time? Did it happen after you were done playing? You looked around and said, "Hey, I yeah. still want to be involved in the game." How did how did coaching come about? It, you know, it was kind. Of, it was kind. Of, I really hadn't planned on it. Uh, I knew I wanted to teach. Uh, teach in high school. I really enjoyed teaching in high school. And when I got done playing college, um, my college coach came to me and said, "There's an opportunity." Uh, to coach a ninth grade freshman boys team in the town where I was going to college. And I said, well, yeah, I'll give it a shot. I never really thought about it until that point. And when I was done playing, I got the opportunity to coach a ninth grade freshman boys basketball team, had zero experience coaching. Uh, and I jumped at that. And from then on, I knew that that's what I wanted to do. I I just kind of fell in love with the coaching side of it. So it's not like something I grew up wanting to do like a lot of coaches do. I, to be honest with you, I didn't know what I wanted to do. I just knew I wanted to, to teach and be in education. My whole family uh, is in education. But once I, once I had that one year of coaching those ninth grade boys, I knew that that's what I wanted to do. All right. So think back to that time. What do you remember <laughs> about that first coaching experience? What do you remember about what, what was – let's put it this way. I'm going to speak from experience as – thinking back to my own first time coaching what was overwhelming to you as a first time coach and then what was something maybe that you thought let's focus on the positive too what was something that you think you right. were pretty good at maybe out of the gate i don't know if i was good at anything i, I was bad <laughs> at a lot of things but let me tell you what i remember and, and it's funny you're, you're the first team you ever coach i re remember every kid's name on that team this is 42 years ago i remember every kid's name on that team I remember our record. I remember the wins, the losses. Um, what what surprised me most was the parents. I wasn't ready for that. Um, you, you know, the high school parents, you know, and, and, and the experience with all that. So that, that was the thing that probably surprised me the most and that I wasn't prepared for was how to deal with the parents. Uh, but it was a great experience. I, I, it's funny. I remember all those kids. I can see their faces. Uh, you know, I remember the record. I remember the wins, the losses, and uh, and the whole thing. It's funny how you, you remember your first team. Yeah, no question about that. I think that some of those teams and, and kids that you know you have a connection with, and obviously your first one, yeah. you you develop a strong bond with them because it's your first time through that experience, and mm -hmm. you, those memories those memories stick with you without question. So since you didn't have a previous idea or a previous thought that you wanted to coach, what was it about that first experience that really grabbed the hold of you and said, hey, this is something that I could see myself doing for the remainder of my, what I assume at that point was going to be your teaching career. So what made you think that, hey, this is something I want to stick with. This is something that I really want to do. Well, a couple things. Number one, I love the practices. I love going to practice and, and getting on the court with guys and, and trying to teach and, and get them better. The second thing was I love the competition. Uh, of trying to prepare to beat somebody and and i li like the practices more than the games but i like the games because it, it was it was competitive and i've always been pretty competitive so those two things were kind of what really propelled me and and understand i didn't know a thing about going into i was i was 21 22 years old 21 i think i just turned 21 and i didn't know anything about coaching and had no idea how to run a practice offense, Steve. All I knew was what I, what I had learned from my college coach. So, I, the, you know, the biggest thing was, you know, to learn what I didn't know, and just 
start to grow and progress from there and go to clinics and work camps and try to you know develop as, as a coach. All right, so let's talk about that. Let's hit on that right there because I think that's an important point for people who are both new to the coaching profession and also have been around coaching for a long time. Just describe some of those things maybe in a little bit more detail that you did to improve yourself as a coach. Once you realized, hey, this is what I want to do, how did you mm -hmm. go about getting better at your craft to make sure that the second year when you came back that you were a better <laughs> coach than you were the first time? Okay, this was the early 1980s. This is 1980-81. There was no... Um, there was no internet. There was no none of that stuff. The only way you could improve as a coach is to go to coaching's clinics, go to watch teams practice, and work camps in the summertime. Uh, that that was the only way to really improve. Uh, and, you know, we buy. I bought all the books. You know, but the main thing was I started going to coaching clinics. I'll never forget the first coaching clinic I ever went to was in 1980. Uh, it, they used to have these things uh, put on by Converse. And they had a coaching clinic in San Jose, California, and, and Bobby Knight was the featured speaker. And uh, I just really enjoyed the clinic, and I fell in love with going to clinics and, you know, keeping notes and trying to you know, learn as much as I could from as many different coaches. So that was the first thing. The second thing was a couple of years later, I got into, really got into going to summer camps and working camps because back then, you know, there was no AAU circuit. Uh, a lot of the good players would actually go to summer camps, uh, teaching camps. And I was able to start going to those a little bit and, and actually getting hands-on experience. So those two things, the clinics and then going to camps really, really helped me develop as a coach. And then the other thing was as, as much as I could go watch other teams practice, college teams at the time. Uh, so those three things. You know, I would really, I would really, you know, now coaches, you know, the guys go on the internet and they look at all these videos and they think, oh, I can do that. You know, we didn't have that back in the day. We, you know, we had books, we had clinics and we had camps. That's how we learned. Do you remember a specific team or coach that you went to practice, that you went to their practice and that really had a big impact on you from that time? I'll tell you what, um, I, I, I'm from the Central Valley of California, and I remember as a young high school coach, there was a couple of coaches in our area. One was a, a coach named Boyd Grant, uh, and he coached at Fresno State back in the early 80s, and he had a lot of success back in the day. Uh, as a matter of fact, Ron Adams was his lead assistant. And I remember going to watch Boyd Grant's practices and, and how detailed he was, especially defensively, and how good they were defensively, uh, and the attention to detail and the teaching. Um, there was another coach <laughs> that I would go to his practice, and uh, you're not going to know this guy, but the people from this area would know. He was a junior college coach uh, at, at Kings River College, and his name was Keith Hughes. And uh, you, know, you could learn a whole bunch from watching the old school guys. And I remember going to their practices and, and really being blown away by what I saw. And then I was able to start. Uh, going to some UNLV practices in the, in the mid eighties when, when coach Tark was there and, and being able to spend a little time watching them practice and just, you know, the way they played so hard and, and the attention to the defensive side of the ball. And I really enjoyed those three coaches. So just probably off the top of my head, I remember going to those three coaches and watching them practice and, and learning so much. So as a young high school coach, when you eventually, got the opportunity to take over your own program. Mm -hmm. Describe what that was like for you the first time that you became <laughs> the head man, had to make all the decisions, and right. what the challenges were for you as a first-time high school coach, as best you can remember. Well, I, I, I spent a year as a, as, a, as a freshman coach and uh, three years as a JV coach. And then I, first, and then I finally got my own uh, job as a head varsity coach. And I, I still wasn't prepared. Even after like four years as a JV coach, I'd never been prepared to be a head varsity coach and be in charge of the whole program. And I was off. Um, that first year, I'll never forget it. We didn't win a game. Um, I, I didn't do a good job with my staff. I didn't do a good job with the kids. Um, 
I, I just needed more experience. And I look back on that and, and I just, how, how poorly I did that, that first year. We didn't win a game. We were really bad. <laughs> and, and it was mostly my fault. I'll, I'll take responsibility. And so then something happened in my coaching career that totally changed everything for me. And that was the principal at the school that, that, that hired me as my first time as a varsity coach. You know, he probably should have fired me at the end of the year, but he didn't. <laughs> He said, look, young fella, you need to call this guy and you need to go and work his basketball school. And I'd heard of this basketball school being from California and it was called Snow Valley Basketball School and it was in Santa Barbara. And he was he was friends with the owner. So he, I got in touch with the owner and he was for I was fortunate enough that he allowed me to come and begin to work Snow Valley basketball school. And this was in the mid eighties and he didn't, it was pretty prestigious back then. It was, you know, we didn't have AAU and, and a lot of top college coaches would go work Snow Valley and high school coaches. And so it was tough to get into. So, but the principal kind of vouched for me and in the summer of 1984, I'll never forget it. Summer of 1984, uh, I went to Snow Valley Basketball School in Santa Barbara for the first time and opened up my eyes to what I didn't know and how I could really improve. And And I think that was the, kind of the turning point in my career as a high school coach uh, was Snow Valley Basketball School. I think and, I, and, I, and I did it for 20 some consecutive years and to this day continue to go teach at Snow Valley Basketball School in Iowa. And I think it's just... You know, Jason and I had the opportunity to go out there this summer oh, yeah? uh, for the first time. Yeah, yeah Coach Show. Uh, we had Coach yeah. Show on the podcast uh, right near the beginning, probably last uh, nice fall, uh, well, last fall. And we talked to him about, you know, just, yeah. again, the possibility of us maybe going out there. And then he was gracious enough to uh, give us an invite to come out. And it was just, we walked away from there just blown away by the quality of the people yeah. that were there. And to your point... Uh, I could totally see that if you walked in there as a young high school coach and now you're surrounded by all these different people that are from all over the country that are bringing their ideas, their thoughts, and then put into this structure, uh, it's just, it was it was an amazing experience for us to be a part of it. And I think it yeah. speaks highly of the fact that the people that come back year after year after year after year, regardless of the level of basketball that they're coaching, they still want to come back and be a part of that staff and be a part of that experience. And I think you're obviously one of those people that has, you know, started out as a high school coach. Now you're working in the NBA and you still have this connection with Snow Valley because of the, the gratitude you have for what it did for you as a young high school coach. And I, I can just see where once you're in, as Coach Schlaubaugh told us, once you're in, you're in. And well, I think that's just... Yeah, it's so true. Um, and that's when I, when I met Coach Show Walter in August of 1984. And people that don't know the history of Snow Valley, you know, it was started by a man named Herb Libsey, um, who still, you know, scouts for the Denver Nuggets in the NBA. And he's a legend. And there's there's Snow Valley guys all throughout the NBA. I, I remember going my first few years, it was all the Van Gundys, Bill, the father, Stan and Jeff. Uh, you know, several, Tim Gergerich, uh, you know, um, I, I remember going on the court with, you know, Pete Newell and, you know, Mike Dunlap and, and just famous, you know, guys that coached in the NBA, you know, Pat, Pat Riley, um, all those guys. So it was, uh, yeah, but you got to remember, this was back when there was no AAU. And uh, one of the places people went to, to coach and do clinics was Snow Valley Basketball School. I mean, I could go down the list. You'd be amazed at the, at the quality of coaches that, that have come, come there to teach and to work. Um, you know, a Jack Ramsey, you know, the legendary coach in the trail. I remember him getting on the floor and he was really into exercising and plyometrics and, you know, fitness and all that stuff. And he's putting the kids through all these drills and everything. <laughs> I mean, you know, it, it, it was really an eye opener for a young coach like me. And, and I've just been going back ever since. Yeah. It's a, it's a fantastic atmosphere. It's just one of those things where, we were just, like I said, blown away by the quality of the people. And we weren't surprised based on all the guys that we had had an opportunity to have on the podcast already, starting with Coach Show. And then, you know, we've had Greg White and Nick Legalbo and Nick Schaff and Marshall Cho and 
just you know it, it's just amazing the, the the list of guys that come back year after year to be a part of it that are just doing great things in the game and I could totally see where it got you hooked right from <laughs> you know right from a young age and you know you're still going back every year to get your fix and I can totally understand totally understand why so now, go, now, now, part part of the reason was we had a good time. Now, oh yeah, don't get no, me wrong. Hey, don't get us wrong either. Uh, don't oh, get us wrong either. And, you know, we we had a whole group, you know, a whole crew of coaches that would, would go and have a great time. This is when it was six days. It was almost a full week. It was, you know, and boy, we had some good times. Well, let's just that, leave it. Let's just leave it at that. Understood. <laughs> basketball uh, basketball players don't necessarily have a good understanding of. What may happen after hours at a basketball camp? <laughs> let's put it that way. Let's put it that way. Yeah. I know I had no idea. I, let's. Let me, I'll, I'll tell you my quick story. I used to go to Ohio State's basketball camp when I was a kid. So this was in. Uh, I'm going to turn 50 uh, next year. So this was probably around I would say the mid 80s, and I would go to Ohio State's basketball camp as a you know as a player. And then when I was 19, when I was playing at Kent State, I got a chance to go down and work. And then I was part of the coaching staff and so uh-huh. the things that went on with the coaching staff like the last the, the night uh the final night of camp uh, the party at the varsity club in columbus with all the coaches and you know the you had to if you were a new if you were a new coach you had to tell you had to tell it stand up and tell a joke and it was just uh you know you had no idea as a kid <laughs> that that these things were going on while you were sleeping uh what the coaches were <laughs> what the coaches were out having a good time and uh you know, bonding and having having a lot of fun. So I can I can completely relate to what you're saying. Yeah, and, and it's something that I think you know a lot, lot, lot of coaches today and, and are affiliated with AAU programs and AAU teams, and they kind of miss out on that. Um, you know, there's not a whole lot of those those teaching camps left, and I real really feel like the young coaches today kind of miss out. And, you know, when I have, I have young coaches call me all the time, you know, advice, how do I move up? What do I do? This and that. I say, go work camps, go learn how to coach, go learn how to teach. You know, you know, you, you got to go to a station and you got 10 guys and, and you got to teach them a certain drill or a skill or whatever. You got to do that. You know, a lot of guys nowadays, they just, you know, they just take 10 or 15 guys and they go play games. Right. You know, and yeah. I think that really hurts them. I, I, I think the, um, you know, the lack of opportunity to go to teaching camps like we used to when we were younger is just not there today that it was. Yeah, I think there's, you know, we've talked to a bunch of coaches here on the podcast about the youth basketball system that we have in place today. And we've talked about it mostly from the perspective of the impact of players and just the fact that players spend a lot less time playing pickup basketball and everything is organized now and it's in the AAU system and you have a coach and you have a nice gym and you have referees and all that kind of thing and just the impact that it has on the way players develop and I always make the point and again being sort of an old school person in this way is that pickup basketball is what I attribute the success that I was able to have as a basketball player I attribute that to my experience growing up on the playground and playing pickup basketball and kids don't have that same experience today and it's neither here nor there there are positives and negatives to both systems but I think you raise an interesting point that we haven't really talked about very much which is for coaches as well there's just not the same level of opportunity to go and work at as you described in these teaching camps whereas almost everybody used to have a teaching camp before now Mm -hmm. it's much more rare and a lot of times you still have camps where even if a college has a camp, a lot of times they're just bringing in kids to play as opposed to really do the teaching of the fundamentals. And as a coach, if all you're doing is coaching games and you're never really coaching that practice environment, you're never really working on trying to get kids to improve their skills and improve their game, you know, you're, you're losing out on something that I think was key to your development and probably to mine as a coach or people from our, you know, people from our demographic, our era. Yeah, and and the relationships that that I developed, um, you know, last last to this day. Um, some of my best friends in coaching are, are are coaches that I met through through Snow Valley. So, yeah, I, we're we're excited to we're we're definitely having it on our on our yearly trip to, uh, yearly trip to Iowa. So <laughs> I, I took my I took my son with me this summer. Uh, so Jason and I and my son made the road trip from here in Cleveland out to Iowa, and my son immediately as soon as it was over we were getting in the car he's like are we going back next year can we come back again i've got to, we got to come back so 
So well, we'll that's, you know, that's, that's an interesting point because to me, the, the, the one and only goal of youth basketball, and I'm talking about everything up until like high school, the only goal should be those kids wanting to come back and play again next year. That's it. Yeah, totally true. Couldn't agree more. If, if they say, I can't wait to play again next year, then you've done your job. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. I say that all the time. Like, so I, I have youth camps here in Cleveland that I've been running for. This, this next summer will be my 28th year of doing that, mostly for elementary school kids. And I always tell the parents and I tell the kids the same thing. I said, I have three goals for you here at camp. One is I want you to have fun. Two, I want you to learn something about basketball. And three, I want what we do here to inspire you to want to play more basketball. And that might be just inspiring you to pick up a ball and go shoot in the driveway. It might be just you asking your dad or your mom to go down the basement and pass the ball with you. Or maybe it inspires you to you know, want to be on a school team or whatever. But I think those three things, as you said, if you can just make the game fun for kids so they want to keep coming back, then eventually when the game progresses and it gets more serious as kids get older – then they have this foundation of love for the game that is really what ends up determining their level of success anyway. I have this conversation, I'm sure you have it, you talked about parents before. You, know, you have these conversations with parents who want something for their kid that their kid doesn't necessarily want. And I always tell people, look, if your kid doesn't love it, if they don't love working on their game and getting out and playing, then no matter what you do, it's not really going to matter because they're never going to work on it enough to, to, ever be, to ever be good at it. If they don't, if they don't love it, so I think that's a great point that you made. That developing that love for the game and, and wanting kids to come back and play again is really what it's all about. Mm-hmm. All right, so before we let's let's move from transition from high school and talk about okay. how, how you moved on to uh, your next your next opportunity and, well, and just talk a little bit about the progression through uh, you know from high school as you, as you move through your career. Well, yeah, I spent I spent uh, 15 years uh, total in high school. Uh, I believe nine as a head varsity coach, but 15 total. And you know, from small rural high schools to large urban high schools, you know, I, I kind of experienced both of them. As you've listened to the Hoop Heads podcast, one common topic that continually comes up in our conversations is character. I'm fortunate to be associated with the Positive Coaching Alliance, a national nonprofit movement that provides valuable tools, training, and resources for coaches, athletes, parents, and administrators that is centered around sports and educational psychology and organizational behavior research. PCA combines this research with practical advice from a national advisory board of top pro and college athletes and coaches who utilize PCA principles at the highest levels of competition. Through a partnership with our local Cleveland chapter of the PCA, we are pleased to offer a discount code to allow you, our listeners, to take a PCA online course for just $20. To take advantage of this offer, visit the store on positivecoach.org and enter the discount code HOOPHEADS20. That's HOOPHEADS20 with two capital H's. Coaches, I hope you'll take advantage of this great offer from the Positive Coaching Alliance and help us continue to grow the game. After I was done in high school, I was I was had the opportunity to be uh, become an assistant at, at a junior college for a couple of years, uh, an assistant at a Division two college uh, where I played for a year, and then to spend three years uh, at, at the Division one level with Coach uh, Tarkanian at Fresno State his last three years. So you know from high school, then I you know hit junior college, hit Division two, and then uh, Division one. So. What was the big? And it, was, it was really never a goal of mine to to move up and do that kind of stuff. It's just the opportunities presented themselves, and uh, I, I just took it. So um, compare. What was the difference? High school to college. What did you like more about college basketball? What did you like less compared to high school? Well, high school was my favorite of, of all the levels I've been at. Uh, the most fun I had was as a high school coach. The the relationships you develop with the kids, uh, the amount of time you spend with the kids. Um, I, I still have to this day, you know, kids that I coached 35 years ago that I have still have really good relationships with. So that was my favorite. The, the biggest adjustment to going to college is, and, and I was, it, I, I don't know if you've ever been around JUCO, but 
JUCO is a great experience. I think everybody should experience junior college basketball. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, because you, you never know what's going to happen. You never know what problem is going to come through that door um, uh, on any given day. I mean, the kids, you, you know, they come from all different kinds of situations. And they're there for a reason, and it's, and it's usually not a reason of, of their choice. So you got to be prepared to handle any kind of curveball that comes at you that day with those JUCO kids. And I, and I love – I played JUCO. I'm a JUCO guy. You know, I was a product of the California junior college system. And so I, I, I kind of was one of those kids, you know. Uh, so I, I love coaching the junior college. Now I was never a head coach, so I didn't have to deal with a lot of <laughs> a lot of the stuff that the head coach did. Right. But I was fortunate that the coach that I worked under had won a California State Junior College Championship, which is tough to do in California. It's very competitive. So his style was was really different, and I was able to learn. Uh, you kind of learn what not to do sometimes uh, when you're working for guys, and and I learned a lot of that under him. But he was very successful with the way he approached it um so it was probably it was a great learning experience uh, from that point all right give us your best jerry tarkanian story <laughs> there's we don't have enough time and there's so <laughs> many you got to pick but, one you got to pick out pick out one pick out one clean one <laughs> well no, i'm just teasing I, no the, I, I tell you what the great thing about coach and he was a great coach make no mistake about it i don't care what you've heard uh you know what you've read he was a great basketball coach, and he, he did two things as well as anybody. Number one, he got his kids to play hard consistently. And number two, he got them to play together and unselfishly. And not easy to do with some of the kids that he had, if you know what I mean. I know exactly. Okay, and he got those kids to play hard, and he got them to play together and, and unselfishly. So... That alone, in my eyes, makes him, you know, and deservedly a Hall of Fame coach. Um, he let them be who they are, sometimes to a fault, maybe. Um, he demanded uh, that they defend and gave them a whole lot of freedom on offense. Uh, the players loved him, uh, it probably because he let them be who they were. Um, Excellent defensive coach, loved practice, um, got nervous before every game. I mean, that, that was real. Um, a loss was devastating, and a win was so much fun with coach. Um, and, you know, naturally all, all the things that come with just being, being around him, you know, watching how he was in practice. He loved practice. Um, he had excellent assistant coaches. He had long practices that were hard. I mean, it, 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 if, if, if the NBA guys had seen some of the practices we had. <laughs> he, wasn't load, he wasn't load managing his guys? No, is that what no, you're saying? No, no, no they'd, be calling the, uh, they'd be calling the players' union and, and protesting. <laughs> uh, so, you know, that, 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 you know, that being said, he was just a really, really great guy to work. He, and he let you do your job. You know, he just, you know, I, I was the video guy. Um, but he also let us coach, you know, as a video guy, you know, I went there knowing that coach is going to let me get on the floor and coach. Um, so it was, it was a lot of fun. And, and plus the fact that my wife, a little history here, my wife's grandfather was a, was a, was a uh, coach here in Fresno. At Fresno State. He was a football coach back in the fifties and coach Tarkanian was kind of like his student assistant. So my, my wife's family had a, had a kind of had a connection with Coach going way back to when he was a player at Fresno State. So that was kind of cool. And I'd always, you know, watched his teams at Vegas, and I'd read about him, and I knew everything I could about him. So when I got the chance to go, you know, work at Fresno State for him, you know, I jumped at the chance. And I, it was so much fun. And I still have really good relationships with some of those players that we had, Melvin, Eli, Larry Abney, uh, guys like that that we had. Uh, 20 years ago uh, so it was a great experience all right so talk about you've mentioned a couple of times and i think it's important i just want to hear your perspective on this you've talked about how the relationships with players that have played for you in the past is so important to you so can you talk for just a minute about how you go about developing those relationships what is it that you do 
on a day-to-day -day basis with the kids that you're coaching to try to help improve and develop those relationships so that you not only are having an impact on them in the moment, both as basketball players and as people, but that hopefully your impact is stretching well beyond those years that you have them in front of you on the practice court. How do you go about developing those kinds of relationships that you're describing? Well, I, I think that's the reason we all get into you know, coaching and teaching in the first place. Um, and, and the number one thing is you, they got to know how much you care about them until, you know, they don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. That's kind of the thing I've always, and they can, you know, high school kids, college kids, they can smell BS a mile away. And you just got to be, you got to be genuine. You got to be honest with them. You got to be you. Uh, you got to show them that you care about them on and off the court. That And Coach Tarkanian was great at that. Um, you know, other coaches that I've been around, uh, George Ravlin, a legendary coach, you know, they cared about their guys off the court. And it's just something that you, you just do, you develop it, you know, and, and players will know right away if you're genuine and you're sincere, you're not, or, you know, are you out just for you? And, you know, is coach just trying to climb the ladder and get the next job or is he really, you know, there for us? So I think that's, I don't, I don't know. There's no formula. You know, you just got to be you and you got to be honest. You got to be genuine, but there's no secret formula that, that, but that's the most important thing. I mean, look, we get into this as young guys and teachers, and it's not about the money. Because if you, uh, if you want to be a high school coach and, and you're doing it to get rich or crazy. <laughs> that's, that's for sure. Especially, especially nowadays, if you calculate out a high school coach's pay per hour, at this point in the year 2019, uh, I think you're making about 10 cents an hour. Yeah, that's <laughs> that's about right. Yep. <laughs> All right, so let's let's transition again. Let's go from college to how you get an opportunity to work your way into the NBA. Let's talk about that for yeah. a couple minutes, and then I want to give you a chance at the very end to just talk to high school coaches and do a quick rundown of your. 10 mistakes that high school coaches make. So let's quickly touch on oh. your pro experience and then we'll jump over to that 10 mistakes that high school coaches should look to avoid. Okay. Well, first of all, it was, it was, it was never like a goal of mine to be in the NBA. I just got lucky. Um, kind of right place, right time. Um, after, after I finished coaching in college, I, I continued as a high school teacher. Didn't want to really, I, I go back and, and be a head high school coach again. And I started um, working in the summers in the off season um, and, and really got into player development. And I was lucky enough to hook up with Tim Grover, uh, who ran a thing called Attack Athletics in Chicago. Uh, I don't know if you guys have ever heard. Yep, Tim he, Grover. You know, he worked Michael, out a Michael, lot of Michael players. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, Michael's guy and Kobe's guy. Anyway, through a very close friend of mine, Mike Procopio, um, who worked for Tim and I got to know Mike through Nike and through Snow Valley. He, he, uh, he set it up where I could come out in the summers and work with him and Tim Grover and the NBA players. So did that for about four summers and it was great. I mean, learning from those guys and working with NBA players was, was just great. We had so much fun and, and I learned a ton. And, and in the summer of 2008, I was in Chicago players and the Bulls had hired a new head coach who I didn't know from Adam. His name was Vinny Del Negro. And the Bulls hired Vinny and through another friend of mine who was their video coordinator uh, calls me and says, look, Vinny's trying to hire a player development coach. Would you be interested? And I well, I mean, you know, I live in California. You know, my <laughs> wife and my family's here. I said, right. Well, let me, you know, I need to run this by my wife and everything. And I wasn't going to take the job. Uh, when it was offered, long story short, Vinny, you know, I went and, and interviewed for the job and the interview was, you know, work out these players and he offered me the job. I was, and he didn't know me. I didn't know him. So it was kind of a leap of faith on both of our parts, but I wasn't going to originally take the job. I didn't want to, you know, leave my family and move to Chicago. And my wife said, she's so supportive. She said, you got to do it. You'll regret it the rest of your life if you don't at least, you know, take a swing at it. So long story short, I, I took the job, and uh, that's how I initially got into the NBA. But, but let me tell you, for all the young coaches who are going to listen to this, um, 
if you if you want to move up in this profession, don't get married. And if you're married, you better have a very supportive wife, like I did, um, because you know I, I've seen so many so many marriages ruined uh, because. You know, the coach and the wife aren't on the same page when it comes to jobs and moving and relocation and stuff like that. So my my wife was very supportive. And so stayed with the Bulls for, for two years with Vinny. Then we got fired there. And he was uh, hired right after he got fired from the Bulls. I'd say a couple months later, he was hired by the Clippers. And he brought me with him to the Clippers and uh, been there ever since. So how do you transition from – when Vinny loses his job as the head coach and the organization kind of shifts all around you, how does it work that you end up staying with the Clippers? What does that process look like? Just for people who might have a well, question about how does he stay with a new, a whole new administration when they, when, when a new group comes in? Well, yeah, it was, you know, you know, and you know, we had three really good years with the Clippers with Vinny. Um, you know, we went to the playoffs two of the three years and, when Vinny lost his job with the Clippers and they hired Doc, I didn't, I didn't know what I was going to do. Um, but, you know, Doc took a chance on me. Um, he, he kept me on staff. And, you know, we stayed there for three more years working with Doc and everybody. And, and uh, that was a great experience. Yeah. So I was very fortunate that Doc kept me on for, for uh, you know, the next three years. And then after that, I transitioned to uh, what I do now in the front office, working for uh, as a scout for pro personnel. The Head Start Basketball Holiday Camp for boys and girls in grades 1 through 6 will be held on December 26th and 27th. Join us for two fun days of basketball fundamentals, contests, and small-sided games. You can find more information or get registered at headstartbasketball.com. All right, so give us the one-minute synopsis of what you what you do right now, and then let's quickly talk about those ten mistakes that high school coaches make, and then we'll let you get out of here. Oh uh, well, what I do now is you know I'm I, I do pro personnel scouting. Uh, I'm mainly my responsibility is mainly the Western Conference, um, but uh, you know we we do have some some responsibility for crossing over into the, the Eastern Conference, but mainly it's the Western Conference team since I, I live in LA and I'm able to, to see the Western teams uh, more easily. So that's kind of what I do now, and uh, I love it. It's it's really good. I, you know I can't you know they pay me to go watch NBA games. <laughs> so <laughs> that's good. You like you that? Know, and, and you know I work for a a great organization. Uh, you know I I, I was there. You know, with the with the old, old owner, and I, I've seen it transition uh, tremendously. Let me just leave it at that. <laughs> yeah, it has to be like night and day. I'm sure we can only imagine. We won't we won't probe any further. We won't probe any further than that. We'll we'll leave that we'll leave that one we'll leave that one alone. All right. So before we get out, just give us the quick synopsis of for high school basketball coaches out there who may be listening. Uh, just give us those. Quick, a quick rundown of those ten mistakes that high school coaches <laughs> typically make, and we we can maybe dive well, into a little bit of detail on one or two of them. Okay, you know, and I, you know, I just I thought about this with a good friend of mine. We a few years ago we sat down and we made this list, um, and I've made all these mistakes. Trust me, but yeah, you know, the first one is like take a bad job. You know, there's no budget, there's no tradition. You got no players. You got to probably the most important thing in a bad job is an unrealistic administration, you know, principal that thinks you should be better than, than your players. Uh, and, you know, maybe a superintendent or something that has un, unrealistic uh, expectations of you. So that's, that's the first thing is to take a bad job. I've seen that one before. Oh yeah. You know, we've all been there. And so, <laughs> yeah. you know what, man, sometimes, sometimes it's good to take a bad job. It is. I mean, you, you learn how hard it is. Uh, you know, to go to make a program, you know, into something that's desirable. Um, the second thing, uh, failure to improve at your craft. You know, I, I see a lot of uh, college or uh, high school coaches, and I was one of them. You know, we spend all this time working at the outside things, you know, boosters and media and trying to promote themselves uh, at the expense of, you know, <laughs> working with your players. You know, I, I think that's. That's something that uh, we have to be careful at. Uh, the third thing, and this is really a, a pet peeve of mine, 
uh, too much complaining at the officials. I mean, how many times you go to a high school game and, and, and the high school refs are just on the officials the whole game? And then you see it rub off, and then now their assistants are yelling at them, and then the players are yelling at them, and then the parents are yelling at them. <laughs> um, you know, it's just – and I and I used to be that guy, and I you know, if I ever coached high school again, you know I, I think that's something that I would really be aware of, because let's be honest, at, at most levels the high school officiating is not very good. Well, and you're not going to change. You're not going to change that official's <laughs> mind, and you're not going to probably have a yeah. positive influence anyway. I know yeah. when I've I know when I've officiated games and guys start yelling at me, they get a lot less calls after that. I know that for sure. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, and so I I think that's something. That's a mistake that I made that I, I see a lot of high school coaches. The fourth thing is uh, not spending enough time in practice on special situations. You know, some games are blowouts either way. But, you know, for the close games, the teams need, they really need to have prepared for what's going to happen so they're not facing it the first time. Um, I, I see a lot of young high school coaches who don't spend enough time on those special situations. And at the end of the game, they panic and the players panic. Uh, so I would recommend preparing and spending way more time in special situations. Um, number five, excessive talking at practice. You know, we need to, we need to coach and teach and sound bites. You know, I, I, you know, I, I hate to go to a high school practice and the coach stops it. And then for five minutes, he gives them a dissertation on, you know, uh, I've been there doing this, that myself. The, That's one thing I know, feel like I I've mean, got, I feel like I've gotten way better. <laughs> at that coaching because they don't listen to you after 15 seconds they're no, staring no. at the ceiling or somebody else's feet yeah. and you're gone yeah you, you got to think like they think and they and if they don't want to hear you talk five minutes you know after they've stopped you know and, and you're going on and on about something so better efficient use of practice time i think is how we should put it uh six not spending enough time off the court with your players um uh, these are the guys you need to buy in. You know, they need to see and know you away from basketball. Uh, that's one of the things we talked about earlier. With w one of the things I enjoyed about high school so much, and I was a classroom teacher, and I had a lot of my kids, my players in my classroom, and I also coached three sports. Like at the small school, <laughs> you're going to coach three sports. You know, you need the money, and you're going to have those kids a lot of the times on 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 your teams in the other sports. So I, I think that's really important. Uh, number seven, more devotion to the fundamentals. You know, passing, shooting, footwork, understanding. You know, a, a huge thing to me is the difference between a good shot and a bad shot. Sounds simple. But getting players to understand that, uh, you know, dribbling with a purpose, for example. So I think more devotion to the fundamentals um, is really important. Number eight, uh, not worrying about who's the boss. All right. It's it's a, it's all about the players. It's just not about the coach. Uh, being able to avoid controversy and talking down to players, having too many rules. Uh, you know, you got the job. They know who the boss is. You know, you don't have to prove it to them. Uh, it's about them. It's not about the coach. Uh, thinking their philosophy is more important than their personnel. How many times have you seen? You know, and, and me as a as a young coach, I I did that. Um, you know, your philosophy is more important than what your players can and can't do. You got to be flexible. You know, you got to be able to, to adapt to your personnel. And in high school, in a normal high school situation, normal, okay, you know, you're going to get whoever walks through that door. Right. You know, now with, with some high school programs, with all the recruiting, and now I understand all that, but in a normal high school situation, um, you, you got to be able to adapt to whoever it is, you know, comes into your gym. And sometimes you got to you ditch your style of play for something different. And the last one is is coaches that just fall in love with drills. You know, we're gonna we're gonna you know we're gonna do this drill because I really love this drill. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Every so drill true. should have a purpose. I mean, how many times have you gone to a high school gym or practice and seen a team do three on two, two on one for fifteen minutes? Yep. I mean, come on, come on, man. Right. It's just a waste of time. Yep. Uh, you know, so really understand that every drill should have a purpose directly related to something that is part of what your team is trying to accomplish. You know, it, and it drives me crazy. And I did it. I mean, I was one of those guys that, you know, 
you know, I saw this drill. We're going to do this drill because I saw this and this worked at so and so. And, you know, falling in love with drills is good, but just make sure that they have a purpose in what you're trying to accomplish. So that's kind of my, my little spiel on mistakes that high school coaches make. Those are, that's a great list. <laughs> I think any coach who's, any high school coaches out there who's listening, I think any one of those things you could take to heart and we probably could do 15 minutes on each one of those mistakes sure. oh, no, and, no question. and dive no into question. them, dive into them a lot deeper. But I think just for people getting an opportunity to hear those and hopefully it'll give somebody an opportunity to sit back and maybe reflect on their own coaching, their own situation somebody who's in a job hunt right now, uh, you know, and is thinking about changing jobs or may look for a new opportunity. I think that advice is, is spot on. Dave, we cannot thank you enough <laughs> for being willing to come on with us tonight. Uh, I just, just want to give you a chance before we get out, give people a way that they can reach out to you. Oh, and I know I, I have one other thing I want to ask you. Sure. Hoop of the day. Where do those oh, photos, yeah. where do those photos come from on Twitter? Where do you get those? Do people send those well, to you now, or how do how do you come up with them? Well, well, some most of them are pictures that I've taken or that I've found. But every now and then, you know, guys will send me random from you know around the world. They'll send me a picture randomly, and I, I try to give them credit for it when I can. But it's just you know something that started like three years ago, and now it's you know every morning that's kind of like first thing I do. It's that's like, awesome. Okay. You know, I, I don't know. It's, that's it's, good, it's, it's it's good little, stuff. That's, that's good really stuff. the only thing I do on social media is the hoop of the day. Well, it's good stuff, oh. man. I, I like it. All right, so <laughs> let, let people know how they can find you on Twitter and then how oh. people can reach out to you if they uh, just want to say thanks for coming on or they want to reach out and talk some hoops with you. Okay. Well, you know, my email, if anybody, if I can help anybody out there, uh, my email is, is jimrat at gmail.com and it's J Y M. R A T T at gmail.com. Um, anything that I could help you with the Twitter. I'm, I'm going to be honest with you. Let me see if I can find it. I really don't know what, the, what do they call it? Like you're at something. Let me yeah, see I mean, if I can and, find it. And I, Dave I, underscore Severns. There it is. I don't even know. It. That's it. There Jason's on it for us. <clears throat> <laughs> All right. Well, perfect. Uh, we want to, again, thank you for spending the time with us today, Dave. It was a pleasure get a chance to talk to you and to everyone out there. We will catch you on our next episode. Thanks. Head Start Basketball's Player Development Academy offers Cleveland area players a unique opportunity to improve their basketball skills. Regardless of a player's age, skill level, or position, training with Head Start Basketball will elevate your game to the next level. Do you want to improve your ball handling, become a better shooter, or develop into a more skilled, confident player? Our academy classes offer training that's designed to do just that. Our training sessions are innovative and will have you learning skills that are transferable to actual games. We have four different class skill levels for boys and girls ages four and up. All Player Development Academy classes will be held at the Strongsville Recreation Center. For more information or to get registered, please visit www.headstartbasketball.com. Thanks for listening to the Hoop Heads Podcast presented by Head Start Basketball.